Hey everybody, welcome to part five of the Willys Project. We're gonna continue our mechanical inspection of the vehicle. We still have a lot of things to inspect yet and uh, probably a lot of things to fix before we can deem this truck roadworthy. So for this video, we're gonna look underneath at the frame, suspension. I'm also gonna try to fix the door latches because neither one of them work very well. But first we're gonna start with an inspection of the tires. They look pretty good, but there's actually a lot of information that you can get off the sidewall of a tire. So starting here, this is the size of the tire. So it's made to fit a wheel that's seven inches wide and 16 inches in diameter. And here we have some good information. This has given us the recommended tire pressure. And this one is max 45 PSI. NDT, any guesses for what that means? Well, these tires are non-directional tread. Now we have some really good information right here that's hard to read, so let me zoom in on that. All right, we're gonna forget about all these letters right in here. All we care about are the last four numbers in the series here, which in this case is 2105. Those numbers are important. They tell us the manufacturing date of the tire. So the first two numbers are gonna be the week it was manufactured and the second two numbers are going to be the year. So in this case, this tire is manufactured in the 21st week of 2005. The date codes are usually only on one side of the tire. So for example, on this vehicle, not all four tires got installed the same way. I think two of them have the date code facing out so you can read it and I think the other two have the date code on the inside of the tire. I've already checked all five of these tires and they were all manufactured in 2005. The other thing that's unique about these tires is the word military. And all five of these tires have that word in the sidewalls, but uh, again, that word is only on one side. They didn't print it on both sides for whatever reason. The word military on this one happens to be on the outside where we can easily read it. And conversely, the date code on this one is on the back side. So coming back to this right rear here, let's just check the air pressure and see what it's at. Yeah. I don't know if you can read that, but we're only about 24 PSI, max being 45. These tires are so big and thick that you can't always see with your eye if the tire is low on air like this one i can't i couldn't tell when it was on the ground it looked like it was fine but it's almost at 50 percent of where it should be before we take this truck out on the road for a test drive i'm definitely going to air all these tires up probably to about 40. there's no reason to go to the max of 45 it's just not necessary so uh, i think 40 is a good place to start we're not ready to drive this truck quite yet. We still have some more inspecting to do. So uh, we'll air these up another we time. Determined, so we determined by reading the date code that these tires were made in 2005. That puts these at 18 years old. So for occasional use, these old tires would probably be just fine. But for more frequent driving, more mileage, uh, maybe even off-roading, or just peace of mind, we may want to replace them. The good news is that the tires are in good condition despite their age, so it's not a decision we have to make right now. We can move on with the project and decide whether or not we want to replace them at a later date. All right, I'm going to get this thing up on some ramps so we have a little bit of room to work underneath. And before I do that, listen to this rattle over here. I've already figured out what that rattle is. I'll show you that in a couple minutes here. All right, we're going in. For those of you that don't know, this is the frame rail right here. And it goes back above the spring, beyond the shock. And it also comes up here to the front of the truck up by the front bumper. That's the underside of the bed right there. 
one thing I noticed pretty much right away is all the shiny oily dirt and grime it's completely covering the bottom of the bed and the bottom of the body up here it's so evenly distributed it looks to me like it was intentionally sprayed on here and people will do this a lot of times with uh, East Coast cars or anywhere in the country where they salt the roads during the winter time if you don't have this metal coated with something and you drive in the winter time with that salt on the roads and the moisture it will stick to the bottom of the body it will stick to the frame and that salt and water will eventually uh, rust the metal away so people make up different concoctions of oils and greases and I probably would have done the same thing on this truck it really does make a difference I'm, uh, so I'm on, over on the driver's side here frame rails look really good over here I don't see any rust at all they look to be completely intact so that is fantastic news so this is the frame right here but this is the bottom of the cab and you can obviously see we've got some uh, body rot right there this whole area looks like it was also coated with that oil rust prevention material whatever it was but it was either put on after this rust occurred or somehow the rust still got through and it's completely blown away right up in there and there's some issues right there as well the other side isn't quite as bad as this but it's basically the same thing that's going on there's some rot and some rust and while I'm down here let's just show you the exterior of the bottom of the uh, cab real quick this is the bottom of the driver's side door and uh, the bottom of the body and you can see we've got some rot right there as well here I am over on the passenger side now and you see this it looks like an outer layer of metal almost and then there's rust inside of it well that's not metal at all that's just body filler and uh, it's rusting out big time underneath the body filler so whenever this repair was made it wasn't done properly and uh, moisture got underneath it and actually made the rust worse there and we've got the same thing going on here it's cracked and there's a hole there same thing occurring there and here's some more of that old body work you can see again that it's rusting underneath the paint and the uh, body filler and that's only going to get worse with time so things like that you know that's going to have to be fixed somehow at the very minimum the rust needs to be stopped so the frame is good the rust and rot that we found on the body you know most of that stuff can be fixed but we're going to have to make a decision on that down the road so we're going to put a asterisk by that we're going to have to come back to that later all right remember that rattling that i pointed out this is obviously the muffler this is the exhaust pipe that goes to the uh, rear of the vehicle and then the front of the vehicle is up there and this right here is the bracket that's supposed to provide support for the muffler on the frame but the bracket is broken off from the frame so the muffler is doing like this when the truck is running so the only thing that is holding this exhaust pipe and muffler off the ground is this bracket right here and the exhaust manifold on the engine between the engine and the rear of the truck there uh, there's no support for the exhaust whatsoever so that's not good we're putting undue pressure on the uh, exhaust pipe up here by the manifold and, and eventually if that doesn't get fixed it will probably crack up there if you see right there that's where this bracket actually broke in half um, so I'm gonna have to repair this somehow I can re-weld that maybe or the easier thing might be to just fabricate a new piece of angle iron and make my own bracket maybe even just bolt it right here instead of weld it I think I think I like that plan better I've got the old bracket removed from the truck and right there is where it broke off from the frame so I think I'm going to uh, try to reproduce this and fabricate my own bracket 
The only thing I'm going to do differently is instead of welding it to the frame, I'm going to make a tab come up about 90 degrees and we're just going to use that already existing bolt in the frame just to bolt it on there. And I found some angle iron in my stash that I think will work. It's just a skosh larger and a little bit thicker, but that's actually a good thing because this piece is always going to be kind of vibrating there, so it's, it's good that it's nice and strong. Well, after some flying sparks, this is what I've got so far. So now I just need to weld a tab on this piece at a 90 degree angle that way. And then we can drill our holes and uh, paint it and install it. All right, here's the tab. And I just need to weld it on like that. And it's actually gonna sit just a little bit like that because there's a slight angle to this piece. But uh, I'm happy with it so far, it looks good. Let's get it welded up. All right, here's the piece. I like the way this is fitting because you see how the muffler is below the bracket? Well, when we get the bolt on there, that'll suck it right up into the bracket and that should provide excellent support for it. And let me show you my new favorite tool here. This is my spray paint shaker. If I can remember how to operate it. There we go. I just got it and I really haven't used it much yet. All right, here we go. If you ever wonder why your spray paint cans keep clogging up on you, that's because generally we don't shake these nearly enough. So hopefully that new tool will do the trick for me. All right, she's done. We shouldn't have any more rattling and we should have excellent support now for the muffler and the exhaust pipe. All right, besides that bracket that we fixed, uh, the exhaust seems to be just fine, so we'll cross that off the list. All right, let's see if we can get this door to close. This is kind of bugging me. You can see how the handle is sticky. See that? Now I have access to the back side of the mechanism. Let me get some uh, lube squirted up in there and see if that doesn't do the trick. Now it feels better already. I'm gonna put some lube in here as well. And as long as we're in here, we'll put some lube on the uh, window regulator joints. Well, the window regulator feels great. Yeah. 
and uh, let's try the door. Huge improvement. You can also see the outer trigger isn't sticky anymore. Let me show you what's going on with the passenger door. First of all, this whole time I thought the door was locked and it isn't. It's just incredibly hard to operate. If you pull really hard, you can get it to work. Let's get this door panel off and see if we can lube up the mechanism on the inside here and see if that'll fix it or not. Uh, I hope it does because these door handles don't seem to be available for sale. And uh, I saw a pair on eBay, one pair of new old stock door handles just like this with the key. And no kidding, the guy's asking 1200 bucks. So I think we can fix the ones that we have here, hopefully. Well, it looks like a simple lubrication is not going to do the trick. It's still stuck. It's uh, you know a little bit more free than it was before, but it's still not engaging the mechanism for some reason. So I guess we got to go in a little deeper. Let's take the door handle off and see what we can see. other one that holds the door handle on is up in there. You can't see it. The nut on the back in there was a three eighths and it had this little star lock washer on it. Let's get this all cleaned up first and we'll be able to see what we're dealing with. Well, the problem is either in this mechanism here or the problem is the mechanism in the door. But let's look at this one first. See, after it's all the way squeezed in, I can still pull up on the trigger a little bit more. And I don't know if that's uh, the way it's supposed to be or not. It just doesn't feel like it, you get a good pull on it. Right in there, there's a flat piece. I can't tell how long it is. And that's what the door trigger pushes on. You pull the trigger, and this thing goes in there and pushes on this tab, and that's what releases the door. For example, if I take the screwdriver and I push on the tab, I can get it to work. I do have to push kind of hard on it, but I'm thinking that this is the more of the problem than the handle itself is. So I'm gonna try to lube this up and uh, see what I can do with this and I'll bring you back. All right, well, I've been working on this for a while. I've got the door panel back on and everything else. And uh, it opens much better than it did before. It's still a little bit stiff. It closes all right, but I can get it open with one hand now anyway. So that's a big... All right, now we're gonna take a look at the shocks and the suspension. And it doesn't take too long to see that we have a problem here. I'm gonna take this uh, cotter pin and washer off in just a second. But you can clearly see that um, the bushing is completely missing on the top there. Watch this when I rotate it. And the bottom is exactly the same. Because there's no bushing in there, it's just sort of banging on this mount. And um, let's get this removed and see if this has been damaged at all because of that. Yeah, this is just some random fender type washer. This doesn't belong here. Now you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. 
Here, I'll put up a photo of what a normal shock end should look like. And you can compare the two. And yeah, look at the bottom when I pull up and down on it. That is terrible. The good news is I think the metal that makes up the shocks is a softer type of metal than these posts are because I don't see any damage on this post up here. And I do see damage inside the top of the shock mount there. All right, here I am under the rear of the vehicle now. And like I said before, all these shocks are the same. All the bushings are missing and we've got these fender washers just keeping them on. All right, here's our brand new shocks made in USA. And this is what a bushing is supposed to look like in the end of a shock. When you're ordering these, you have to be a little bit careful because the fronts are different from the rears. The fronts are a little shorter, measured from center to center in the bushing. The fronts are about 19 and a half inches and the rears are about 23 inches, fully extended like they are now. All right, here's the old and the new side by side. And uh, they're completely different units. The old one is even maybe an inch shorter. It's fatter, doesn't have a uh, guard on top. Oh, yeah. We're also gonna put some new cotter pins in. All right, one down, three to go. As long as we're in here, I wanna show you the leaf spring situation real quick. Um, yeah, they're old and a little crusty, but you know, they don't look horrible. Um, but you can see how we've got the, um, the spring retainers on the front, one there and one there. But on the back, we're missing this one right there. That's why these springs are spread out like that but it's not a high priority item, so we'll just uh, do that another time. Ah. Left hand thread. The rears you have to get to from kind of the inside like this versus the front where you could reach in from the outside. So there's no reason to take the wheel off here.
So we're gonna wrap this video up before it gets too much longer, but I'm not done underneath here. There's still many more things to inspect. We have brakes, we have the differentials, we have the drive shafts, the transmission and the transfer case. And I did find a leak on the transfer case that we need to investigate. And all this is pretty important stuff. These are all essential systems. So we'll go through all of those items first. After that, we'll check out the lights and the electrical system. And we'll be that much closer to getting the truck uh, safe and roadworthy again. Thanks everybody for watching. As always, we'll catch you on the next video. Take care everybody.